and multitasking vehicles designed to do everything from carry troops to field reconnaissance to bringing their own brand of firepower to the battlefield. So get a good grip on it, Gomer. It's time to lock and load. This is one of the most devastating weapons in our arsenal today. And a lot of people get very confused about it. Damn thing's got tracks like a tank. Got a big ass gun like a tank. Looks, feels, even smells like a tank, but it's not. So you're probably asking yourself, well, what is it? It's a butt-kicking Bradley, an armored fighting vehicle. And it's different from a tank like this Abrams. You see, the tank's main job is to spearhead an attack ahead of advancing infantry. Armored fighting vehicles are designed to get the troops where they're needed. So they can go in and finish the job. I guess you could argue that the legendary Trojan horse of Greek mythology was one of the earliest examples of armored personnel carriers. But things didn't really get going with AFVs until the arrival of the internal combustion engine. Then in World War I, the British developed a derivative of their iconic Mark I tank, which could carry up to 30 troops and protect them from machine gun fire as well. But with a top speed of just four miles per hour, it could just about keep up with the soldiers on foot. The Second World War was when this foot soldier's best friend really got going. By World War II, every country had their very own fleet of armored vehicles. Now this one here played an important role for the Allied forces. It's an M8 Greyhound, Mission Recon. 1943, M8, light armored car, carries four crew, speed 56 miles per hour. The American M8 was introduced to World War II in 1943. Its main job was reconnaissance. It would cruise ahead of the division, look for signs of the enemy, then radio that intel back to the command. It had to be light and fast, and that's why the Brits called it the Greyhound. And its six-wheel design gave it that speed. It also packed machine guns and hard-hitting cannons. Plus, its armor could repel most small arms fire. And here's my good buddy, Harlan Glenn, to tell us about it. There's 19 millimeters of armor plate up here and in the front. On the bottom, you've only got three millimeters, but they have to keep it light to keep it mobile to maintain that speed. If it was, you know, weighed down with heavy armor plate, let's say like a Sherman tank, they're not going to be able to go very fast. Then it's not a fast reconnaissance vehicle. So Harlan, tell me, what's the range of the vehicle? About 400 miles, Gunny. Oh, that's a long ways. Yeah. For a... It's like a horse for the cavalry to go out and scout and come back and report to the CEO on what they found. The M8 was so stealthy at carrying out its wartime recon work, the Nazis nicknamed these units the Ghosts of Patton's Army. Well, let's see how this ghostly Greyhound moves. The first thing you notice is just how quiet it runs. Not bad at all. Perfect for snooping around on a recon mission. But what I'm really interested in is how it shoots. The machine gunner's job was to lay down firepower while the driver got them out of trouble. So what we've done is we've set up a little drill to demonstrate how the Greyhound does when the lead starts flying. Oh yeah, full speed ahead, guys. Let's get it done. suppressive fire as he can while the driver uses his skills to get us out of arm's way and that's the job done 
As a recon vehicle, the M8 Greyhound is about as good as it gets. But it's not designed to carry passengers. There isn't any room. For that, you need a vehicle that can bring a squad of grunts up to the front lines and then cover their butts while they attack. And the Germans already had one. Well, now that took something a little bit bigger. Like, say, the half track. World War II, the 251 half track. Carries two crew plus 10 troops. Speed, 32 miles per hour. With the half track, the Jerry's thought they could have their strudel and eat it too. From the front, this baby looks like a truck on steroids. From the back, this thing looks kind of like a tank. Well, it's both. Sort of. The wheels at the front let it steer like an ordinary vehicle with a regular steering wheel. No, pretty much anyone can climb in, crank it up, and drive away. Now compare that with fully tracked tanks of World War II, like the Stewart. These steering sticks took a lot more practice to master. So when it came to steering the half track, the Germans kept it simple. That was a big advantage. It took less training and was more user friendly. Meanwhile, the tracks at the rear allowed it to come to grips with some seriously rough terrain. As well as its crew of two, the original 251 could carry 10 assault troops. That's an entire squad, or Zug in crowd lingo. And they were all protected by armor plate, which just like on the M8, was less than one inch thick. But those crafty Nazis had a trick up their sleeve that allowed the half track's armor to punch above its weight. And proud half track owner Jack LaGreca is in on their secret. One thing the Germans realized was if you kept everything angled, that you increased the, the uh, deflection for every piece of the armor. Yeah, but it just makes a lot of sense. You know, yeah. if they're shooting at you from up front, they're gonna hit that thing and they can't help but hit it. At, it's gotta hit an angle. Exactly, it? yeah, it's gotta taper off. So the half track gets top marks for innovation. But just how does this half-breed Hunmobile handle off-road? Much of this is pretty self-explanatory. Sort of the that clutch yep. and the brake. And you got the accelerator right there. So, what do you think, Jack? Crack this baby up and go for a little ticket for a ride, yeah. The half track is not powered by the front wheels. They're just for steering. All the drive comes from the Caterpillar tracks on the back. These got the German grenadiers across terrain the M8 could only dream about. The 251 didn't just haul troops around. No, sir, the Germans mounted everything from machine guns to howitzers on this thing, which turned it into a fast-moving, deadly weapon. Like the 20-millimeter flak gun. Now, we can't fire this one because it's a museum piece. So, we've got one we can fire rigged up on this old flak wagon instead. A flak gun like this made a half track a pretty potent offensive weapon. These flak guns were designed to take out aircraft, but the Germans figured out pretty quick that they could take out ground troops and lightly armored enemy vehicles just as well. So stand by to catch some flak. My ex-girlfriend's car out there. Wonderful. Go ahead and lock and load here, Jack. All right. Charging, we're loaded. All right, here we go. Now, the flak gun ain't no point-and-shoot affair. Your hands are busy adjusting the traverse and elevation of the gun. So you've got to fire this thing with your feet. And I've got an itchy trigger toe. All right, here we go.
ground. Yeah, that's what I like to see. Nothing quite like the smell of black powder in the morning. Now remember, the half-track was designed for a totally different role than the M8. It carried troops over rough terrain and put them where they needed to be. In WW2, the U.S. built half-tracks of our own. But by Vietnam, our APCs were really rocking and rolling. You're gonna like what's coming up next. This one's from my era. Don't go away. We're talking armored fighting vehicles. The M8 was a recon car. Its six wheels were only so-so for off-road work. The half-track was more of a go-anywhere vehicle. But the open top left the troops inside exposed, and the front wheels struggled on the rough ground. So, the old military motorheads went back to the drawing board. What they came up with? One of the most successful armored vehicles of all time, the M113. A fully enclosed, fully tracked, armored vehicle fielded just in time for the Vietnam War. 1960, the M113 carries two crew and 11 troops. Speed, 42 miles per hour. This is an M901. It's an M113 on steroids. It's been modified to fire tow missiles, which makes this a tank killer. But underneath, it's exactly the same flesh and bones as the original M113. This was our first modern battle taxi, used for bringing grunts into the thick of the fight. Because the M113 was a fully tracked vehicle, it could handle all the challenging terrain that Southeast Asia could throw at it. It was fast, light, and could pretty much go anywhere. It was a big leap in engineering from armored workhorses like the German 251 half-track. The M113 was fully tracked, so unlike the 251, it could handle all types of difficult terrain. And while it carried the same number of soldiers, the M113's men were fully enclosed and protected with new aluminum armor that repelled small arms fire just like steel. But it was still light enough to be air mobile and water resistant enough to ford small rivers. This baby ate rice patties for breakfast. Now that's at least a foot of mud and a foot of water. And as Staff Sergeant Ian Brown explains, it could handle much deeper water than that. When these tracks are moved by the driver by giving it gas, they actually create propulsion in the water. So while this vehicle is floating, this is the means that it goes forward in the water. And it can travel at about three and a half miles per hour in the water. So we no longer need that combat bridge. We don't have to call the engineers anymore. We just drive right on through the river. You got it. In Vietnam, this go-anywhere vehicle was soon taking a toll on the enemy, literally by grinding and smashing over heavy jungle thickets. The bad guys who weren't crushed by it nicknamed it the Green Dragon. I got to see just how well this dragon flies. This post-Vietnam variant, the M901, can get up to 40 miles an hour. Now that's not up there with the M8's 56 miles an hour, but it leaves a slower half track in the dust. And if you were paying attention earlier, then you'd know that you drove the half track with a steering wheel. Back in the day though, any fully tracked vehicle still needed the old fashioned steering sticks. And the M113 wasn't any different. For the troops riding in the back, it wasn't exactly the lap of luxury. Inside, it's noisy, bumpy, and hot. Well, at least it was fully enclosed. 
and it did provide some protection from above for the 11 grunts who rode inside. But it didn't take the bad guys long to find its Achilles heel. The M113 had a weak underbelly. The Viet Cong cleverly placed mines and booby traps along roads and trails. Dummy. This would lead, as you know, to a lot of the troops riding on the top of the APC, because when those mines and booby traps went off, they would decimate the inside. That's why you'd see the M113 going by with an entire squad riding on top. That lightweight armor was great for speed, but gave you pretty much zip in the protection department. Even so, its sheer versatility kept it in service. M113 quickly became the backbone of the infantry. The designers created several variations. You could pretty much put any weapon you wanted on the M113. Some of them had flamethrowers. Others had grenade launchers. Later, they had tow anti-tank missiles. And there was always the good old Claymore mine. And, of course, not forgetting the trusty 50 caliber heavy machine gun. This baby will do some serious damage. Let's go on the mission, Staff Sergeant. Let's go shoot some. Now imagine it's Vietnam, late 1960s. I'm on the lookout for any threat to me and my guys down below. That bamboo hut looks like a good spot to hide an enemy ammo dump. So I figure it's time to give old Charlie a wake-up call. the job nothing quite like a nice explosion at the end of the day right Hell yeah. kind of gets rid of all the stress so you can go home stress free Hoorah! being lightweight fully tracked and versatile has made the m113 one of the most important armored fighting vehicles in history over 80,000 of all types have been produced and used by more than 50 countries. But the wheels of progress keep on turning. And along came the Bradley, a vehicle that's got it all. Troop carrier and butt kicker all rolled into one. The Bradley fighting vehicle is coming up next. vehicle design has come a long way since the half track hit the battlefield carrying its troops and weapons. When war broke out in Southeast Asia, the USA rolled out the M113. It carried our boys from one end of Vietnam to the other. But its lightweight, thin armor soon proved it wasn't quite up to the job. And its firepower would have been darn useless against battlefield heavyweights like tanks. The military was looking for an armored vehicle that could carry troops, but also had the speed and firepower to chase down enemy tanks and kill them. Well, their wish came true with the Bradley. 1981, the Bradley carries three crew, six troops. Speed, 41 miles per hour. The Bradley is a fully tracked fighting vehicle with sophisticated armor to safely deliver troops into battle. But the Bradley is not your granddaddy's battle taxi. Oh, no. Between the 25-millimeter chain gun and a 7.62-millimeter machine gun and tow missiles, the Bradley delivers more than just troops. This is one state-of-the-art fighting vehicle with a head-knocking power punch. The Bradley has taken over from the M113 as the U.S. military's fully-tracked fighting vehicle. It has a 
a crew of three and carries up to six troops in the back. Its aluminum and ceramic armor gives better protection than the M113. Its wider tracks make it more stable on rough ground, and it can even power through water at seven miles an hour. Introduced back in 1981, it wasn't until the Gulf War, nearly a decade later when it first saw action. Since then, over 6,000 of these bad boys have been patrolling the Badlands from Basra to Baghdad. U.S. Army Major McDonough earned himself a Bronze Star for service in Iraq. Here at the Aberdeen Test Center in Maryland, he's the Bradley go-to guy. He carries not just the firepower to destroy any vehicle in the world, but more importantly, it carries uh, some dedicated infantrymen in the back. Basically, it can take troops to the battle, and then it can hang around and support those troops while they're fighting. Absolutely. During the first Gulf War, the Bradley destroyed more Iraqi armored vehicles than the mighty Abrams tank. But it also struggled against Iraqi... tank weapons like rocket propelled grenades its thin armor just doesn't offer enough protection the same problem the german half tracks couldn't beat with their angled armor and the m113 also fell short with its aluminum armor so for the bradley the solution was this add on armor the bradley reactive tile or brat tile which provides uh, protection against all handheld anti-tank uh, shoulder fired missiles the tiles are reactive armor that covers the front, sides, and turret of the Bradley. Each tile has a slab of explosive sandwiched between two metal plates. When hit, the explosive between the plates detonates, neutralizing the incoming round. An advantage the M113 never had back in Vietnam. It's a simple little thing. You know, but it's a pretty important thing. Absolutely. The Bradley's got some cool stuff that earlier AFVs didn't have, like air conditioning, shock absorbing seats to prevent injury from a road mine, and a video display to see what's going on outside. I hear this thing rides pretty sweet too. Let's see how this baby handles. The first thing you noticed about driving the Bradley is that it steers just like a car. A bit like the half-track of World War II, and much easier than the steering sticks of the M113. But with wider tracks and a 600 horsepower turbo diesel engine, it's every bit as fast as its lightweight predecessor. This is my baby right here. This is the sports car. And if I wanted to fight, oh yeah, this, this is a great gun to be doing it with, you know? I'm talking about the 25 millimeter chain gun. Remember how I told you that to fire guns on earlier AFBs meant the gunner was up on top, exposed like a setting duck? Well, with Bradley, the gunner is safe inside the vehicle, so he can concentrate on the job at hand. Instead of ducking. Now imagine this two inch steel plate is the side of an Iraqi tank. Okay, here goes, baby. I bet it's no match for a 25 millimeter chain gun. It is deadly accurate. See for yourself. Yeah, that target won't come around bothering anybody ever, ever again. That target is dead meat. No question about it. But up against 
real heavy armor, the Bradley packs an even bigger punch, thanks to its tow anti-tank missile. Now, the Bradley has to stop before it can fire these high-explosive, shape-charged warheads. Okay, missile away. But since they travel at close to the speed of sound and reach out two and a half miles, there isn't much chance of escape. I'll be damned. That's neat stuff. Since it first came into action, the Bradley has proved to be a reliable, survivable, and lethal war machine. But the modern battlefield needs even faster vehicles that can carry even more troops. Up next, a line of vehicles built to fight and survive unconventional warfare in the 21st century, the MRAP. Okay, let's go over where we've been with the armored vehicle. World War II saw the M8 recon car. It was light and fast on flat surfaces, but only carried a crew of four. The half-track could carry a squad of 10 over rough terrain, but left them a little exposed up on top. The fully-tracked M113 put the troops in a totally enclosed cabin, but it had lightweight armor, a weak belly. So the Bradley introduced high-tech reactive armor. But even that struggles against the ever-present threat from roadside bombs. So a brand new fleet of armored vehicles was created. 2004, the MRAP. Carries two crew plus six to 10 troops. Speed, 65 miles an hour. MRAP stands for Mine Resistant Ambush Protected. It is a class of armored fighting vehicle specifically engineered with one major purpose in mind, to save the lives of troops by protecting them from IEDs or similar roadside bomb attacks. The American MRAP design was based on the lessons learned from the guys and gals fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Guys like Chief Warrant Officer Womble, Gunny, I was in Iraq in 2004, and we didn't have MRAPs. And, and at that time, all the services were scrambling to get their, all their vehicles equipped with whatever armor they could get. And I was actually on a Humvee that got hit with an IED, and, and it was not nice. Troop transports like Humvees and Jeeps have little, if any, armor underneath, making them vulnerable to mines and IEDs. The underside of these vehicles are riddled with pockets where the gas and blast waves of an explosion can be trapped and focused against the vehicle. The results can be dead. What happened was all the services started putting in a requirement to get armor put on their FMTVs, MTVRs, Humvees, and what we ended up getting to was the MRAP platform. Now, these vehicles really are an engineering breakthrough. See, the MRAP has a smooth V-shaped hull. This not only acts like traditional armor, but the smooth sides stop the blast energy from getting trapped. And the V-shape deflects the shrapnel and blast energy out and away from the vehicle. And there's another feature on all MRAPs that helps the V-shaped hull to work. All the vehicles are designed with the raised chassis, which gives you a better standoff from where the blast would explode. So you've got the standoff, and then as the blast explodes, that V-shaped hull allows that fragmentation and the blast to, to blast outwards. Compare this to tracked vehicles like the M113 or the Bradley. They both set much closer to the ground, and their underbellies are flat, making them more vulnerable to an IED blast than an MRAP with its V-shaped hull. This life-saving design is incorporated into each variant type of the MRAP vehicles in service. And there's no shortage of those. These vehicles right here may all look different, but they're all the same family of MRAPs. 
There are three categories of them, and they all have the same mission, protect the troops. Category one, MRAP are four by four vehicles used for patrol in urban areas and confined spaces, carrying up to six troops. And Chief Womble knows all about it. This is a BAE Cat 1 4x4. They took the original BAE Cat 1 and tweaked it. This is what you're looking at. Why would they want something like this? Well, it's smaller, it's lighter than the Cat 2. Mm -hmm. So, provides a little more mobility. Category 2 MRAPs are larger and have six-wheel drive for long-range missions. They're designed to carry up to 10 troops. And this category can be adapted for a whole mess of different jobs. We had the need for a real ambulance, so the engineers went in and developed an ambulance. So it's got all the medical equipment in there that a standard ambulance does. So what about the category three? Well, there's only one type, and it's called the Buffalo. This is exclusive to the Explosive Ordnance Department for the disposal of IEDs and other threats. At 27 feet long, this is the biggest of the bunch, made for two crew, four engineers, and one EOD robot. Those are the guys, you know, that go out and pick up the IEDs and look at them, uh, interrogate them, investigate them. And they can do that from the safety of the vehicle while a remote-controlled robotic arm checks out the suspected IED. They're finding more IEDs than IEDs that go off. You know, a lot of bang for your buck here as far as I'm concerned. But this saves one life, yeah, absolutely. More than 12,000 MRAPs have been deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. We're continuously upgrading, re-engineering, and trying to improve all the platforms. Like this Category 2 MRAP here, called the Kook, and it's being upgraded with a new independent suspension and lighter armor. That's to help keep it on track in the mountains of Afghanistan, where road conditions are, well, somewhat less than perfect. And the main thing, it protects the troops as it drives them into combat. Correct. That's the most important part of this vehicle. Yep. Let's take her for a spin on the Aberdeen Test Center driving course. <clears throat> Gotta be a damn gymnast to get in the thing, don't you? Each category of MRAP can travel at up to 65 miles per hour. As I showed you with the M8 recon car of World War II, wheels are a lot smoother at higher speeds. And a lot quieter than track vehicles like the M113 and company. But MRAP wheels have another big advantage. They can keep driving even if the tires are shot out. <laughs> Look at that. And to take advantage of the Cougar speedy wheels, it has a more powerful engine and higher ground clearance. So it can tackle terrain that's even rougher than Mrs. Gunny's tongue lashing. Woo-hoo-hoo! -hoo. Yes! Oh, man! I gotta tell you, Gunner, this is something... Do you guys have any job openings here? <laughs> they might, Gunny. <laughs> Boy, I could sure use that every day. I think we were airborne in 24 tons. I think so. Oh. And the key point is, nothing's broke. <laughs> nothing's broke. We're ready to go now. MRAP is one smooth runner machine just about anywhere. But I bet you'd be more interested in how it shoots. Well, quit your whining, because we're almost there. Gunny, basically, what you see up there is the Objective Gunner's Protection Kit, what we call the OGPK. And that platform will accept any of the standard four heavy machine guns. Some Category 1 and 2 MRFs use a remote weapon system up top. So the gunner can fire off rounds without being exposed to enemy fire. But I'm a more hands-on kind of guy. Especially with a minigun. Hoorah! Now, I'm no stranger to the minigun. It's been around for a number of years. 
mount one on top of this MRAP, and it turns this troop carrier into a serious offensive weapon. Now, the good folks here at Aberdeen Test Center have set up a target for us to try our hand at. It's a concrete wall about 250 meters downrange. Let's see how I do. In today's urban combat, this concrete wall could easily be hiding a bunch of bad guys with RPGs. Not for long. Many guns rotating multi barrels can fire off more than 3,000 rounds per minute. That's over 50 rounds a second. Oh, yeah, there we go. Now that's what I'm talking about. We knocked the rest of that target down. With its V shaped hull and extreme versatility, the MRAP fleet is a highly survivable line of vehicle. And with the weapons it carries, it can also dish out destruction. With its go-anywhere capability, it can safely operate on any terrain and also keep up with other high-speed combat vehicles, including the Striker. That's coming up next. Armored fighting vehicles have been an essential part of our arsenal for the last century. And one of the latest is the MRAP, a highly survivable fleet of vehicles designed mainly to protect troops in urban combat zones. But for the ultimate in all round protection with a gun that's a real tank killer, the US military came up with this. 2002, the Striker carries two crew plus nine troops. Speed, 62 miles per hour. The Striker is the centerpiece of the U.S. Army's high-tech transformation to becoming a modernized, well-trained, and well-equipped fighting machine. The Striker takes the best of all other fighting vehicles and puts them all into one machine. It has the high-speed wheels of the MRAP, the troop-carrying cargo space of the M113, and it's got some heavy-duty firepower like the Bradley. All of that combined with its state-of-the-art eavesdropping equipment means that the Striker can strike before the enemy knows what struck him. Its eight wheels run fast, quiet, and smooth. In the armored cabin, which protects them from enemy small arms fire. The military is all in and betting the house on this advanced armored fighting vehicle. And Brian Hill, Aberdeen Test Center Striker team leader, will tell us all about it. A lot of the naysayers, when the Striker came out, were upset with the fact that the Army was going to go with a, with a wheeled vehicle over tracks. Track vehicles have a little bit better mobility over cross-country terrain than these, but it takes a lot of time to keep those tracks up and running. Because it has eight tires, if one of them gets shot out, the Striker doesn't skip a beat. So if a round punctures the tire, sure, the tire goes flat, but you can still get out of danger and get, get out of the hot spot. And the striker can be easily adapted for all kinds of roles. It can be a recon mission vehicle like the M8 Greyhound, an infantry carrying vehicle like the M113, and even a medevac vehicle like the MRAP. So the striker really is the best of all previous AFVs rolled into one mighty vehicle. And it's still got the heavy firepower. Sure, you could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with another tank, but... If you have to. If you have to, but, but the Striker's main feature is its mobility. It's a pretty light-skinned vehicle. It can take small arms fire and defend itself pretty well against that. But on the battlefields of Iraq, there's much bigger threats, like improvised roadside bombs. How effective is the armor on this vehicle against those? There are add-on protective armor kits 
depending on the threat that's in the area, they can apply those armor kits to the vehicle. One of the major threats to the striker is the RPG, the rocket-propelled grenade. It's the enemy's weapon of choice. So the striker gets a special type of lightweight armor that doesn't slow the vehicle down. It's known as slat or cage armor. It looks a bit like a baseball catcher's mask. Basically, a grill of steel mesh that wraps around the vehicle. It causes the RPG to detonate before it even gets close to the striker's armored surface. Uh, Brian, I understand that this is a kind of a sneaky vehicle because it's muffled down to the point where you can't hardly hear it. Well, track vehicles have always been pretty loud. Wheeled vehicles are a lot quieter. They call this thing the ghost in theater. It can sneak up on people, but it can get in and get out, sometimes before the bad guys even know it's there. Now, remember the six-wheeled M8 armored car from World War II? It was so darn quiet, its crew became known as Patton's Ghosts. Well, let's see how the striker measures up in the spook stakes. All right, let's rock and roll. Let's go. the striker drives at 62 miles per hour. It's a lot faster than the Bradley's top speed at around 42 miles per hour. And this steering wheel makes the striker a dream to maneuver. And being eight-wheel drive, this beast has some serious off-road capability. Now it's time to check out the weapons. The Striker is built for speed and mobility, and that is a fact. With the amount of firepower it brings to the fight and this 105 millimeter cannon that I'm sitting on right here, hey, that's what separates the men from the boys. The 105 millimeter is the biggest gun ever fitted to this type of vehicle. So let's put this baby to the test. Well, right now, I'm in the commander's seat. You're in the gunner's seat. There are eight rounds right between us right now. Mm -hmm. At any time, we can punch buttons up here on our front panel, select a round type, load it into the gun, and shoot it. Look how that round gets loaded automatically. You can shoot it during the day. You can shoot at night, any time of day, in any weather condition. OK, it's thermal, so that means it uh, you see heat. Yes, that is right. This is what a thermal image looks like. Day or night, rain or shine. I'm seeing the bad guy and lining him up. Okay, Gunny, we have a tank hull at 2,400 meters and we're ready to bust it. It's a clear day, so I'm just gonna line this tank up with my regular sights. There we go, right there, dead on. You are armed and you're clear to fire. Give us an on the way right before you pull the trigger. Round is on the way. Here we go. That's an armor piercing round ripping into that tank. Maximum destruction at its finest. Absolute thing of beauty. But depending on the ammo, this bad boy can take out anything from soft targets to concrete bunkers. Perfect for quick response infantry support. Sure beats the heck out of the M8's machine gun, the half-tracks flak gun, and the M113's weapons. And it does all this while racing around the battlefield at similar speeds to the MRAP. And that's why the striker is so doggone good. End of story. Okay, there you have it, devil dogs. Now, the next time you hear someone call an armored vehicle a tank, you square them away for me, will you? That's Gunnery Sergeant R. Lee Ermey here. Keep your powder dry and your eyes on the target. Carry on.